Media, I'm Robbie Suave. And I'm Amber Duke. On NBC's Meet the Press this weekend, Kirsten Welker asked Senator Tom Cotton about former President Donald Trump's appearance at Arlington Cemetery to commemorate the American soldiers killed during the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan. When Cotton criticized Biden and Harris for failing to meet with the families of the deceased soldiers, Welker interjected that Biden and Harris had done so. But that's not accurate. Take a look. Bottom line, though, I guess, Senator, is it ever appropriate to make campaign content at military graves. He didn't take campaign photos there. These families, Gold Star families, whose children died because of Joe Biden and Kamala Harris's incompetence, invited him to the cemetery. And they asked him to take those photos. Because as they told me yesterday, when I spoke to Kelly Barnett and Darren Hoover, the parents of Taylor Hoover, who has Arkansas ties, they don't get to go to the beach on Labor Day. They don't get to have barbecues. This is their one chance to have a memory of their children to commemorate their service and to honor their sacrifice. They wanted President Trump there. They wanted to take those photos. You know who the families also invited? Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. Where were they? Joe Biden was sitting at a beach. Kamala Harris was sitting at her mansion in Washington, D.C. She was four miles away. Ten minutes. She could have gone to the cemetery and, and honored the sacrifice of those young men and women. But she hasn't. She never has spoken to them or taken a meeting with them. Well, it's they, because they of did her, meet with them during the Dignified it's Transfer. Because of they her, were with them at the Dignified Transfer. Her and, her and Joe Biden's incompetence that those 13 Americans were killed in Afghanistan. Well, obvious problem here is that Kamala Harris was not at the dignified transfer for the 13 service members who were killed. It is true that the family members invited Trump to come to Arlington National Cemetery. I actually had the opportunity to meet quite a few of them back during the State of the Union address, which they went to to try to lobby the Biden administration to finally meet with them for a sit down to explain what went wrong and how their kids were killed. They wanted their children's names read aloud from the dais during the State of the Union address. They've been consistently ignored by the Biden administration for the past three and a half years. Um, the dignified transfer was the only time where they had any face time with Biden. And according to their testimonies, he spent the entire time talking about his son, Bo Biden, who passed away after leaving the military and also was checking his watch consistently throughout the entire ceremony. So for the Biden administration, for the Harris campaign to criticize Trump for his behavior when he's been the only ally of these families, I think is just gross. So NBC News did put out a statement on X saying that, yeah, that statement, the correction she had made that it was not true. Harris did not speak to them. Um, and uh, PolitiFact, I you know, sprung into action every now and then, uh, fact-checking that and saying uh, that was not true, her interjection there. So good to see a uh, correction uh, when it's made. Uh, but yes, Harris did not talk to them. And you know, I, th I think it's, um, in my view, and, and Trump actually, right, he initiated the withdrawal from Afghanistan because we were sick as a country of being involved there, the situation not improving, this couldn't go on forever. And there was a mandate that many of many people on all sides of the political spectrum feeling like this had gone on long enough and it was time to get um, to get Americans home, to get them out of there. That's something I think people wanted Barack Obama to do when they voted for him. Something they wanted um, uh, Donald Trump running on a similar mandate to change the Republican Party in a less um, interventionist and nation building um, direction. None of that is to say that the way it was done was good. Obviously, it was shameful and despicable to have um, people killed in the process. And it's very important to understand what went wrong um, without, in my view, you know, indicting the entire process of becoming less involved in the Middle East, which is a good thing. Yeah, I completely agree. And most Americans agree with the idea of leaving Afghanistan, but most agree that the way it was handled was completely wrong. And I was lucky enough to sit in on some background briefings with the State Department during the Trump negotiations between the Afghan government and the Taliban. And they were very clear, if the Taliban does not meet these minimum commitments for a specific length of time, then the deal's off the table. We're not going to negotiate with them in bad faith. We're not going to let them uh, attack or kill Americans while we're nego negotiating. There certainly were no plans to abandon Bagram Air Base, and mm -hmm. there were no plans to pull the military out before you get out American citizens and the Afghan people who had assisted the military over the past 20 years. And uh, there's been an ongoing House investigation into what exactly went wrong on that day with the Abbey Gate bombing. 
And I think a mutual friend of ours, Jerry Dunleavy, recently resigned from that committee because he felt that they were not mm. asking the right questions. They were not bringing in the right people. They refused to subpoena Antony Blinken. Uh, they just called him in as a witness maybe two weeks mm. ago. They did not talk to Victoria Newland. Uh, they did not talk to uh, Wendy Sherman, some of the other top officials who were involved in the negotiations surrounding this exit and the plans that they had put in place. Several top military officials were left out as well. And perhaps most disturbingly, the chairman of the committee took CENTCOM's investigation conclusions as gospel. Mm. Um, one of which was that the Abbey Gate bombing was not preventable even though the Taliban had freed a prisoner who was the one who committed the bombing shortly before the official U.S. withdrawal date. Uh, so there's no accountability in this entire uh, scenario. Not a single person has been fired, disciplined, anything for their involvement in this and the poor decision making. And so I sympathize with these families immensely and anyone who would accuse them of being political in the search for answers of what happened with their kids' deaths, again, I have no time for it. I think yeah. it's ridiculous. You know, I saw H.R. McMaster's on, uh, doing an interview over the weekend, and Mitt Romney said something similar recently about um, Trump is going to be dangerous, more dangerous the second time around because he won't have the same, he won't be surrounded by the same kind of generals and military experts who helped steer his course <laughs> last time. I mean, you can see where I'm going with this. Yes. That sounds like a benefit, not a defect <laughs> right. to me. The people who, who didn't want him to get out of Afghanistan, you know, John Bolton. Who oh, you're telling me there won't be, Mark Milley yeah. won't be there anymore? Oh, no, oh. not that. No, right. The people that at every turn thwarted, and frankly, thwarted Democrats too, who also were elected with a mandate to uh, draw de to get the U.S. out of its uh, engagements in the Middle East, and who were stymied time and time again by a permanent professional military class that outlasts every administration and is always part of Washington and is actually making policy and making policy that is contrary to the direct political indications of the American people um, in terms of how they want their tax dollars spent and, and what they think is is actually making us safer. Is this making us safer to intervene in Afghanistan? He was talking, Charlie McMaster's was over the weekend about, you know, the the, the setbacks for um, for women under Taliban rule and all of that. And obviously, it tugs at your heartstrings. It's terrible. It's unfortunate. But what can we do about it? We tried to do something about it for more than a decade. We lost lives. We spent. We set on fire so much money to make the place better, more stable. Did we do that? Did we do that in Iraq? Are we doing that in any of these places? The American people have said very clearly, no, we're not persuaded. Um, but the generals think they know better. So I, I, don't, I don't see that as a weakness if those people aren't around the second time. I agree. And unfortunately, all of these people, again, never get held accountable for their decision making. Instead, they're lauded. They leave an administration or the national security apparatus and they get six figure yeah. they uh, leave commentary it this gigs. Much. They leave it and they go into commentary they go into or CNN lobbying. CNN and MSNBC or they join a lobbyist or group. Both. <laughs> or both. Yeah. Right. And they're on your TV probably every day yeah. talking about how evil Trump is or, or Tulsi yeah. Gabbard or anyone who doesn't want the U.S. to be in forever wars. And how evil you are, right, if you're not willing to send even more tax dollars to... Or your kids to go die. To do something right. to make the Middle East to... Right, to overthrow the dictator who is keeping at bay the Islamic extremists, as we found in Libya and so many other places. All right, more free media coming up next.